we don't really talk about how much of an impact Asians have had on America itself. Like, they immigrated into the U.S. and they helped build so much of what America is today, and yet nobody talks about that, you know? We're part of America, too. This is Hear the Burn, a podcast about the people, ideas, and politics that are driving the Bernie Sanders 2020 campaign and the movement to secure a dignified life for everyone living in this country. My name is Brianna Joy Gray, coming to you from campaign headquarters in Washington, D.C. This week, for Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we focus in on some of the issues relevant to Asian American voters including our roundtable of AAPI rock stars from Bernie HQ. I also talked to author and activist Arjun Sethi about the Trump era's epidemic of hate crimes and to Christine Chen of Asian Pacific Islander American Vote about the growing power of Asian American voters. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't realize May was AAPI Heritage Month. It was even news to some of our AAPI panel. I think that sometimes... We ourselves don't get hyped up about our own months or whatever. I don't think we even created this. I don't even know who created this month because <laughs> I didn't know it was to this month. That was Tassin, a video producer for the Bernie Sanders campaign, who is of Bangladeshi descent. Now, she's obviously being a little tongue in cheek, but her joke made me wonder, what are the origins of AAPI Heritage Month? Well, it began in 1977 as Asian American Pacific Islander Week, when Norman Mineta, the first Japanese-American mayor of a major U.S. city, San Jose, co-founder of the Asian-American Pacific Islander Caucus and longest-running Secretary of Commerce, introduced the resolution in the House. And why May? Well, the first people from Japan to immigrate to the U.S. arrived on May 7, 1843. And the Transcontinental Railroad, which was famously built predominantly with the labor of Chinese immigrants, was completed on May 10, 1869. But those were hardly the first Asian immigrants to North America. The first immigrants came from the Philippines on a Spanish galleon in 1587. And by 1763, a group of Filipinas established their first settlement on the outskirts of New Orleans. But the first substantial waves of immigration to mainland U.S. happened around the 1850s during the California Gold Rush. What happened next might feel a little familiar. In fact, the nativist sentiments simmering today at the instigation of our regrettable commander-in-chief sound disturbingly similar to the hateful rhetoric that percolated into the American mainstream after Asians began immigrating to the U.S. in larger numbers. Over the course of the late 19th century, hostility against Asian laborers grew, and violence, including hangings, intensified. In 1875, Congress passed the first immigration law intended to restrict Asian immigrants. It identified forced laborers and Asian women as, quote, undesirable persons to be barred from entering the country. In fact, it was a near total bar of Chinese women from the United States, meaning male laborers could not be reunited with their families. This was followed infamously by the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which barred nearly all immigration from China. This law was the first immigration law to bar immigrants on the basis of race or national origin. But we all know it wasn't the last. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. As it turns out, Concern about growing nativism, xenophobia, and outright hostility against immigrants was repeatedly raised as a key concern when I asked my coworkers about their political priorities. I think it's a huge issue because my family back in Bangladesh, like my, my parents' family, they're still stuck there. And I think they've been in the system for over a decade, almost, I think, maybe almost two decades. And it's crazy because I think they got one letter about four years ago saying, hey, you might be considered to be able to immigrate into the U.S. And they're holding on to that letter still to this day. And I'm like, mm, I don't think you're coming anymore. Like, it's not happening. And 
honestly, they, they need to start looking into other options. But the fact that it takes two like decades or like 12 years to get into the States, that's crazy. Like there needs to be some kind of, I don't know, change. One of the statistics that uh, we learned in another interview on this on this program was that one out of every six undocumented immigrants in America is actually of Asian descent, um, which is something that I didn't really realize, not the picture of immigration that we get. And I wonder, you know, with all of Trump's, you know, nativist, racist lingo, obviously, you know, how much is immigration an issue for you guys and also when you're in conversations with your family and like broader communities? The undocumented issue in particular, I think it's definitely a challenge that is really unseen outside of our communities, but it's very present and it exists. That was Yang John, a constituency organizing director on the campaign. I think this is connected to the broader issue about how the Asian American constituency is really diverse, but this is one thing that really binds us together. And it also is a way where we can come together to fight Trump's xenophobia and also fight for a country where all of us belong to. So the Asian American constituency has so many languages. We have so many ethnic backgrounds. We have different religions. It's really hard for us to have and create a shared identity, but we do have a lot of similar struggles from immigration to healthcare to language barriers. We all want to create a place where we feel like we can belong. And I think that those are some things that bring us together. What do you guys make, given the diversity of the Asian American community, given the en- enormous size and breadth and diversity of a- Asia as a continent, what do you guys make of a- AAPI Month? Because sometimes I feel, I feel often as a black American that there are, are times when we just kind of like create the version, like we reason from like the black version of things and make, you know, versions in, in other for other groups. And there isn't always a direct translation. It doesn't always come across the same way. And I've experienced having to kind of like rustle up my Asian American colleagues at my law firm, et cetera, to be like, okay, what are we going to do for AAPA month? And they're like, I don't know, like whatever the white people want to do. <laughs> right? So, I mean, I mean, what do you make of this? I think that's true. I think that sometimes we ourselves don't get hyped up about our own months or whatever. But at the same time, it's kind of like we do need to rally together and kind of be part of these conversations. But I also kind of feel like AAPI month is, I don't know, maybe maybe I'm different. Like within the South Asian community, we don't really talk about it that much. Like I feel like it's very East Asian or Southeast Asian and they're having these conversations. And I think there's even a disconnect between East Asians and Southeast Asians. Like we're kind of the same, but we're really not at all. I don't know. Not at all, but you know what I mean. Right. And (laughs) even if you think of like the through lines that might connect sort of all of our experiences, whenever there's another month for another like ethnic group or minority or what have you, it's always a reminder of the extent of imperialism in this world and how all of that has shaped the trajectories of our families and where we come from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, America as the the net catch for a lot of that is, I think it's really important to acknowledge. And that was Mia, the campaign's powerhouse video director, and a big part of why you're able to listen to this podcast right now. I remember in college, right? I didn't feel it was completely represented by the Asian Students Alliance, so I made a Southeast Asian Students Alliance, but we still that. party together, right? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's important to create the spaces and create those dialogues that you have with each other. If it takes a month to do that, you know, okay. There are 48 countries in Asia where over 2,300 languages are spoken. And that diversity is represented among Asian Americans as well. That presents certain challenges with respect to voter outreach. And it seems that many politicians simply don't try at all. An issue I brought up with Christine Chen of APIA Vote. 
Asian and Pacific Islander American Vote is a national organization where we work with local Asian American Pacific Islander nonprofits to help build their capacity to increase voter registration, voter participation in elections every year, as well as preparing us for the 2020 census. Okay. So what's the landscape look like in terms of voting rates and registration rates? What what are the kind of barriers that you're, you encounter? So in the past, you know, we have the one of the lowest voter registration rates. But a lot of it, is, if you look at our history, it was only in 1952 that like Chinese Americans were finally able to um, have immigration policy lifted so that mm-hmm. way they can actually immigrate and become citizens mm-hmm. here in the United States. So if you look at this population, it's only more recently that people are becoming U.S. citizens and that they're actually trying to um, register. And we really saw that development really in the last decade where now we see, we're working with nonprofits you know in 27 states where they're actually doing regular voter registration efforts and talking about the issues part of it is also that um, almost 80 percent of our community are first generation immigrants so that means we actually need to demystify the voting process and de- democracy and knowing that you know voting rights laws are so different in each state mm-hmm. um, it's also about educating our top leadership about all those rules and regulations and making them also understand that as a 501c3 organization nonprofit that you're allowed to do this type of nonpartisan work so what are, what are those conversations like when you're in, in, engaging in these communities, you're door knocking, and you're talking to people who might not um, have had a, a past history of being active voters, who might have immigrated from a country where there wasn't the same kind of access to the ballot or democracy that we have here? What kind of stories do you hear? Well, you know, first of all, a lot of people, when we first register them, they're like actually thanking us because this is the first time anyone even approached them to Mm -hmm. actually ask them to register to vote. So that also tells us that there's not enough outreach and work and engagement with the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Also, I think in terms of whether or not, you know, how do you engage them? Well, our community, they don't like to necessarily label themselves as progressives or conservatives or Democrats or Republicans. It's really about that relationship building that they have with a particular candidate, with a particular party. It's also about, like, are you addressing the issues that they care about? And not only during election season, but also year round when they're out in the community. Are you asking them to engage in their town halls? Are you also providing language assistance for those who need that, understanding the complexities, but also understanding that our community is growing, especially since the 2010 census. I asked the HQ crew about what, for many Americans, is the simplest and most direct form of outreach. Talking to your own family. Do you guys have conversations with your parents or other family members about Bernie? Yeah, definitely. But the thing is, since my parents are immigrants, they really don't understand who Bernie is and what he stands for. They they love him and they love him probably the most out of all the other candidates. But at the same time, their immigrant parents, they're kind of jaded. They, they always think that, you know what, we, we want, we have hope, but we're not really sure if what we want will ever be represented, but will ever actually come true. I see a lot of nods. Yeah, I mean... Yes. Um, I also think that my parents are really excited that I'm working on the campaign. And so they have a restaurant in Brooklyn Heights. So they're like, get me a Bernie poster. I want to put it up on the restaurant, Um, which I think is so cute because they aren't really involved in politics that much. So I think there's a responsibility for especially second generation Asian Americans, second generation immigrants to talk to their parents about why they're super excited about Bernie and I think if we actually have real conversations about why our life will be better, why their life will be better, then they're going to be super excited about it too. And they are connected to a network that we aren't connected to. So I really encourage all of us to have those conversations because our parents trust us. Christine Chen told me that as the fastest growing ethnic group in the United States, Asian Americans are shaking up elections all over the country. I read something like the Asian American population has grown by 70 odd percent or something like that since 2000. 
Yeah, you know, actually, like in Nevada and Virginia, they even have grown up to 167 percent. That's wild. Right? So that's really changed the political landscape of those particular states. Even when I look at the last two or three presidential cycles for Nevada, the Latino voters, Asian American voters, uh, along with Latino voters, are really making an impact in Nevada. And we've seen that in terms of the local races, statewide races, and as well as the presidential. So even in 2016, we had you know organizations conducting caucus training programs, as well as in Iowa. Now going to this election cycle, we're seeing presidential candidates actually reach out to the Asian American voters in Nevada to meet with them early on. That actually, I've never seen that in previous cycles. Yeah, I was reading that only 29% of Asian Americans have been reached out to by a political party, by either political party, compared to something like 44% of white voters. It just seems like uh, to be just really politically craven about it, just like cards left on the table. That's correct. So for API Vote, we focus on bringing new registrants into the into the election cycle, but also we reach out to those that are typically not touched. And so we we actually send them regular mailers in language. We conduct phone banking, and then for some areas where we have the capacity to actually also door knock. But what we found in 2018, even though we saw an increase of voter participation, mm-hmm. we still got calls from voters saying, hey, I got your mailer. I don't even know who's on my ballot. Mm. Um, Also, is there information about these candidates? So we know that parties and campaigns are actually not reaching out to them. Mm. You know, I've read a lot about how the diversity of the Asian American community, uh, including a lot of economic diversity, ends up disguising the extent to which discrete populations have very different priorities from other populations, right? So there's kind of a model minority mythology that says, you know, Asian Americans are doing so well in all these respects that kind of erases what's going on with certain groups. Can you talk to that a little bit? Right. So I think that's why we need to dig deeper in terms of the issues and how they actually impact particular populations within the what we call the greater Asian American Pacific Islander community, which really com- encompasses 49 different ethnic communities, yeah. right? But Based on our polling that we've been doing since 2012, every two years, economics, healthcare, education, they actually continue to be at the top level, yeah. right? These are still the same issues that all, many other, other Americans yeah. also care about, right? What we've also seen is that typically, even though they come from different ethnic populations and they may have been here different generations, when you actually pull them on issues, they actually all lean pretty progressive on a wide variety of issues. Everything from immigration to health care to um, uh, the role of government. Actually, a lot of people don't realize that Asian American voters believe that and support a larger government and, lar- and more services. That certainly seemed true of some of the folks I spoke to at HQ who emphasized issues like health care and education when I asked them about their priorities. Well, it starts with my parents. That's Young John again. So I always thought I'd become a doctor because my parents didn't have health care for most of their life. And Bernie is fighting for health care for everyone and staunchly Medicare for all. And I think that separates him from the rest of the pack. If Bernie is elected, then my parents' life will be better. Education. I think that education is so important in our communities, and Bernie probably has the most progressive policies on education. I'm going to interrupt to scene here to correct that probably to a definitely. Bernie recently announced his Thurgood Marshall education plan, which has been described as the most progressive education platform in modern American history. It triples Title I funding to at-risk schools, appoints federal judges to enforce the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and guarantees teachers wages of at least $60,000 a year, a major increase over the current starting salary. In concert with the recommendations of the NAACP, the Thurgood Marshall Plan also ends federal funding for for-profit charter schools, which exacerbates segregation and siphon dollars away from the public education system. Under Bernie's plan, Teachers running GoFundMes on Facebook for essential school supplies would become a thing of the past. But I digress. He's not only helping low-income African-American and Latino communities, but he's helping our communities too. And the thing is, I think, as Asian-Americans, we also have to remember to 
be more inclusive of other low-income communities. I think that we need to do a better job at that. We kind of isolate ourselves. But I think that education is so important. And to be part of a campaign or to, to vote for someone who, you know, is voting for your kids. Mia emphasized both Bernie's progressive immigration platform and his support of labor interests as important draws to the campaign. Everybody knows someone in our communities who is trying to, you know, the phrase is like bring someone over, right? Um, trying to create that network for them to enjoy the benefits of living in this country. And I think what you'll find, and my pitch to them would be, Bernie is hyper aware of the importance of that in creating the American fabric that we all want to see. And additionally, of course, his stance on labor and making sure that workers are treated fairly, that's really important for any one coming into this country without without a network, you know, if they're most likely going to be working jobs that either are paying, you know, maybe minimum wage if they don't have the language background or the educational background that's required to have a, you know, a more elite paying job. So that would be my pitch. African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinx Americans, and Native Americans all rank the economy, healthcare, and education among their top priorities. But framing can be such an important part of whether various groups feel spoken to and heard. So I asked Christine Chen whether she had any insights with respect to the messaging that's most effective in her experience. I'm curious whether, you know, I know that when I'm talking to Black voters and, and, and kind of reading the discourse with Black voters, there is this sense that despite the fact that with us as well, polling shows that our priorities are healthcare, jobs, and the economy, just like general American voters, there's a way in which there's a like a real hunger for those issues to be framed in a certain way that shows that a candidate is interested specifically in reaching out and specifically kind of catering policy with us in mind rather than incidentally. And I wonder if that's something that you see as well or something that's kind of unique to this, my own like African-American context. No, I think as all other Americans, we all care about those particular issues, but they all impact us in different ways. Mm -hmm. So for instance, even though immigration isn't on the top of the polling data, the thing is, a large percentage of our community are first-generation immigrants. So immigration policy is going to impact the way we view the economy in terms of access to education or to health care, right? And so also in terms of when you look at are you third-generation Japanese-American to first-generation Chinese-American or a Hmong refugee or a Vietnamese refugee, yeah. um, where some of them are also dealing with deportation issues right now, especially in the Southeast Asian community. Mm -hmm. or rather a lack thereof, was a theme of sorts throughout this week's interviews, including during my talk with Arjun Sethi. Arjun is the author of a new book called American Hate, Survivors Speak Out. Often it seems like mainstream media is more interested in humanizing white supremacists than they are giving a platform to survivors of hate violence. And so what I did in the aftermath of the 2016 presidential election was travel the country and meet with survivors of hate violence in their homes, houses of worship, workplaces, and documented their stories. I met with Muslims, black folks, Jewish folks, queer folks, trans folks, Latinx, Arab, sick American, undocumented folks, because all of these communities have experienced a vicious uptick in hate violence, bullying, discrimination, really ever since Donald Trump announced that he was running for president of the United States. Here are the stats. The FBI reported 7,175 incidents of hate crimes in 2017. That's the most recent year for which there's data available. The number of offenses presents a 17% increase from 2016 and an uptick for three consecutive years from 5,479 incidents in 2014. But according to Arjun, that number doesn't even begin to capture the reality on the ground. 
Um, so the FBI releases an annual report documenting the total number of hate crimes the preceding year. And so in 2018, the FBI released a report documenting hate crimes in the year 2017. And they reported a steady uptick in hate violence, and they documented somewhere around 8,000 hate crimes, which is a large number. But the true number of hate crimes is actually closer to 250,000 hate crimes. Wow. So why does that gulf exist, 8,000 versus 250,000? Yeah. It's because the FBI report relies on voluntary reporting by local police. It's not mandatory. And so most police departments don't bother reporting or they report zero hate crimes. And so, believe it or not, the 2018 FBI hate crime report doesn't even include the murder of Heather Heyer in Charlottesville. Oh, wow. That's how deficient the data is. Mm. Furthermore, we know from community organizations who track this information, who work with targeted folks every day, that they are experiencing a record number of intakes of people, again, whose houses of worship have been vandalized, people who are experiencing threats on the street, or in some cases have even been assaulted or experienced worse. So I asked Arjun, is it fair to blame Trump for this? I mean, I think I would sort of phrase it and say Donald Trump has done everything in his power, seemingly, to intensify hate in this country, right? Whether it's his rhetoric. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. I love the old days. You know what they used to do to guys like that when they were in a place like this? They'd be carried out on a stretcher, folks. I have to punch him in the face, I'll tell you whether it's this courting of white supremacists. I think there's blame on both sides, but you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. Whether it's his policies. Look, if the president of the United States is going to ban Muslims and refugees, roll back protections for transgender students, roll back and encourage uh, uh, the rescission of Title IX protections, separate and cage undocumented families at the border, right? It's going to put a target on our collective back. And so I will tell you that we should not be afraid to call this president what he is, which is a misogynist, a racist, and a white supremacist who has emboldened and intensified hate in every facet of American life. But enough about Trump. Arjun's right. The stories we don't hear enough of are the victim stories. You know, sometimes people think that hate is a blue state problem. It's a red state problem. It's an urban problem. It's a rural problem. Hate is an American problem. Mm -hmm. And so I went to places like Tulsa, Oklahoma, Providence, Rhode Island, Victoria, Texas, Whitefish, Montana. Here we are sitting in D.C. One of the stories that I include in the book is the story of Taylor Dumpson. Taylor Dumpson is the first black woman to ever be elected student body president at American University. The day that Taylor takes office, April 1st, 2017, nooses are found hanging across campus. Yeah. You might look at that headline and think it was a throwback to 30, 40 years ago. That happened in D.C., miles from the White House. That's yeah. one of the stories. Another story is the story of Jeanette Vizguera. Jeanette Vizguera is Latinx, undocumented, one of the first undocumented immigrants to take sanctuary at a house of worship during the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. And she talks about how she had to part ways with her three U.S.-born children because she feared Donald Trump and ICE were taking her family apart. So not only did she experience this threat of state violence, but she also talked in her testimonial about how when she took sanctuary in the First Unitarian Church in Denver, Colorado, people threatened to blow the church up because they had given her sanctuary. One of the other stories in the book is the story of Destiny Mangum and Walia Muhammad. They were the two young black women who boarded the MAX train in Portland, Oregon mm -hmm. in the summer of 2017, when a white supremacist who was known to police who targeted a black woman just days before, started insulting them and targeting them on account of their appearance, on account of their race, on account of their faith. Um, the two young women, after being insulted, after fearing for their lives, went to the back of the train. Three upstanders intervened. Two of them were stabbed to death. The book uh, is the very first time that Destiny Mangum and Walia Muhammad tell their story together. One other story I will tell you, another example of how state violence leads to hate violence. The very same night that Donald Trump in January of 2017 
said he was going to ban Muslims and refugees from entering the United States and signed that terrible executive order. A mosque in Victoria, Texas, was burned to the ground. The spokesperson for that mosque, Shahid Hashmi, tells his story and the story of the Victoria Muslim community in the book. I asked Arjun, who's sick and wears a turban, whether he encountered any personal hostility on his travels across the U.S. to meet with victims. Sadly, the answer was yes. So I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, meeting the family of Khalid Jabara. Khalid Jabara is an Arab American who was murdered on his front doorstep by a white supremacist who lived next door in August of 2016. And right after interviewing the family in their family home in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I was driving to the airport and someone was tailgating me. And, you know, I didn't really know where I was going, driving a little slow. Um, The car then pulls up to my left And when the person in the car saw my face and saw I had a beard and turban, he became enraged. Um, He started mocking me, he started, you know, uh, uh, parroting and, and sort of mimicking my turban, pointing at me. And I was genuinely scared. And so I immediately pulled over to the side of the road. Uh, When I went to Whitefish, Montana to meet Tanya Gersh, Tanya Gersh is a Jewish American who was viciously cyber trolled on account of being Jewish. Uh, Right after the presidential election, she received somewhere between 800 to 1200 menacing voicemails, emails, text messages, um, not just her, but her entire family. Um, And so when I went to Whitefish, Montana, truthfully, I didn't feel comfortable. Um, And so I would often buy my uh, frozen dinner. It wasn't that it was wasn't it didn't taste very well to be honest good but i would buy a frozen dinner at a local market and warm it up in the hotel and then the last night i was there i was standing in line at the grocery store and a cashier and a customer in line stared me down and i will tell you some years ago i might have been open to having a conversation with them about who am i and what i believe and you know how i belong here and how this is my country too but truthfully in this moment I thought maybe one of them was packing a gun, right? I thought maybe one of them would just hit me. And so I had to just move to another line and protect myself because that's what I felt like I needed to do to sort of extricate myself from that situation. Gosh, that's so unnerving and so disappointing to hear, and I'm sorry for that. Amazingly, though, Arjun's focus and the focus of many other survivors he spoke to wasn't on retribution or vengeance, but on restorative justice. Survivors and community organizations want hate crime laws not because they want to add time to already lengthy prison sentences, not because they want to lean into mass incarceration. It's because calling crimes motivated by hate, hate crimes, allows us to see the intersection among these crimes. We can no longer dismiss them as isolated, as aberrations. Instead, we can dig to the roots, which are often white supremacy, anti-black racism. And so I found that a lot of survivors actually want things like restorative justice. The first story in the book is the story of Asma al bukaye a Syrian refugee to be resettled, first Syrian refugee to ever be resettled in Boise, Idaho. And she talks about how one day her young Muslim son was walking in downtown Boise when someone asked, are you Muslim? When the boy said yes, he was punched to the ground. She was invited to court by the judge in the sentencing hearing, and that sometimes happens. And the judge asked her what would be an appropriate sentence. And she said, Your Honor, The suspect who hurt my child won't learn about Syrians, refugees, or Muslims in jail. He should work with affected communities. He should work with Syrians. He should work with Muslims. And so I found that many survivors are open to restorative justice so long as there is accountability. And I will tell you, often communities of color in particular are asked to to carry this burden of reconciliation, of restorative justice in a way that white folks aren't. And so I think it's really critical that we also emphasize accountability alongside restorative justice. And what what does that look like, if not leading into mass incarceration? Well, you know, I mean, it, it can be very different things. There are some survivors who are open to actually having conversations with communities who disagree with them. Mm -hmm. In some cases, we've seen survivors actually be open to having conversations with people who in some cases have harmed them. Again, there isn't one single answer and every survivor is sort of in a different place. But often they are open again to those conversations or... Again, in some cases, they recommend community service. They recommend education. You know, Diane Su um, is the Asian American who famously in a viral video was told uh, that she couldn't stay stay in an Airbnb uh, because she was Asian. And so she um, was stuck in a snowstorm. And this was like a viral video. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. And so I spoke to her in the context of the book and 
she ended up having a negotiated mediation with the person who discriminated against her. And part of the settlement in that case was for the person who discriminated against her to take a course and write a paper in Asian American studies, Hmm. right? And so we've seen all these extraordinary examples, whether it's having difficult conversations, whether it's community service, or just educating oneself and and trying to remedy one's ignorance. You know what's really funny is I've written about this in the past, the extent to which one should want to or try to or see it va- see it as a valuable thing to do, having conversations with racists, having conversations with people who are your political opposite. And there is one strain of thought that says, this is not a burden that I should have to, sh- to shoulder. And phrased in that kind of conditional tense, I agree. It's not a burden you should have to shoulder. And no one person should feel responsible for doing so if you've got other things going on life happens no you know no individual marginalized you know person from a marginalized group should feel to feel responsible for taking that on but i do find it interesting that there has been a tone of late that says to talk to the person who you need to convince to stop hurting me (laughs) is somehow not in my own interest and it's it's an interesting shuffle i i have always felt like almost a responsibility to do that sort of work. And I feel like compelled to engage with those who differ from me in part because I have such confidence in my ability to sway them because I have such confidence in my political position and my personal position and my equality. And, you know, I feel like maybe perhaps naively a belief in the fundamental goodness of humanity. We'll see how long that lasts. (laughs) But at least right now that like exposure and education and things like that are incredibly powerful and studies bear those results out. I don't know if in the process of writing this book, you know, have you felt more or less confident in the ability to kind of affect change and change people's minds through those kinds of, if not one-on-one engagements, then writing books like this, sharing stories, exposing people to diversity and differences. You know, I, I, you're right to point out that out, and there's a huge tension. And, you know, my position always is, is I, I will never compel anyone to do anything that they're uncomfortable right. with. And so for people who feel like they shouldn't shoulder that burden, they shouldn't have to. I can tell you that, for example, in this book, I don't give any time to white supremacists, Mm -hmm. right? Because as far as I'm concerned, they've already had enough time in the media, right? They've already had their day in the sun going back decades and centuries, right? But I will tell you that just as you pointed out, there are lots of survivors of hate violence who are open to having these conversations. And I will tell you, if survivors of hate violence want to have these conversations, we have to let them have those conversations so long as they feel safe, so long as they are comfortable, and so long as they are aware of the consequences of having those conversations. And I will tell you, I think it's an extraordinary act right? Look at Asma al-Bukhaya, for example. This is a Syrian refugee who lost her husband in the Syrian civil war, took four flights to get here from Egypt with her two young sons. If there was anybody in the world who could have bought into mass incarceration, it was her. And she didn't. And again, I found that repeatedly throughout my work. Um, And so I think it is extraordinary that folks are pivoting away from mass incarceration and pivoting away from just, you know, this sort of full-fledged demonization. Um, But, you know, the other sort of flip side of it, and I think it's also really important for white allies to step up. And so an example I I give in the book is not too long after Charlottesville, there were sister white supremacist marches that were planned for two cities in Tennessee. And it was interesting because the Black Lives Matter chapter came out um, around that time and put out a really powerful statement saying that they would not be joining the sister opposition protest to those rallies because it was white America who would let these white supremacists in. And it was the responsibility of white America to show them out. And so we've also seen extraordinary examples of white allies doing the right thing and having some of those difficult conversations in spaces, frankly, that I can't access. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's the thing. I talked about some of the uh, hate I experienced in places like Whitefish and places like Tulsa. And so even if you were open to having some of these conversations, maybe you could have them. But I will tell you, there's certain places like I just I don't think it's safe for me to go. Yeah. Um, And so it's really important for white allies to do some of that difficult work and and to to go into those spaces where where they have those privileges. And so I think we need both. Yeah, we can't all be uh, with I forget the name of the there's a there's a black man who tells the story of how he has something like 11 K- Ku Klux Klan um, outfit hanging in his 
closet because yes. each one represents a KKK member who he's talked out of being a white supremacist and they give them him over their robes at the end. His name is Daryl Davis and he has a great TED talk called, get this, Clan We Talk. I have some of the robes here with me. This is my first time seeing these up close. This belong, belonged to an imperial wizard, which means national leader. But uh, I tried it on to see what, see what it felt like, what it looked like. You put the KKK robe on. I put the clan robe on and the hood, you know, to see if I felt powerful. I want to see if it had that kind of effect. So I went and stood in the mirror and I looked stupid. So I took it off. Thanks. I've seen his talk. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, no one's expecting yeah. everyone to go quite yeah. into the fire like that. But it's it's an it's an interest. It's always an interesting conversation for me because I often find the people that are kind of closest to the harm are most invested and kind of willing to take on some of that burden because they perceive it as a direct. I, I believe this is my psychological interpretation of what's happening is they see it as like directly impactful. And then if, you know, if they're not going to fight, who's going to do it? It's like there's almost more bi- self-interested buy in. You know and what it's, I mean? it's, it's also so counterintuitive, but I think it also shows the power of forgiveness, yeah. the power of human mercy. And, yeah. you know, one of the stories I tell at the very end of the book is the story of the six of Oak Creek, Wisconsin, mm. you know, and so some years ago um, in August, a white supremacist uh, stormed a Sikh Gurdwara in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, and murdered um, six Sikh worshipers. And the next day, when the Sikh community gathered to recite their holy prayer, they asked their creator, um, it's a monotheistic faith, for forgiveness and for salvation um, and for safety and health for the six folks who had six six who had passed away, but also for the shooter. They prayed for the souls of seven yeah. people, and the media was stunned yeah. because they hadn't seen anything like that. And so I, I have found that there is this extraordinary capacity um, for forgiveness, uh, for mercy. And it's something actually that that inspires me, and it was the part of the, the book and the project that sort of most shook me to my core. Yeah. And and to be clear, those those people who are not there and are still angry and, you know, because there is this there is this kind of media narrative that also happened that says these people, you know, you know, forgave. I think it, the same thing happened um, with the shooter at the uh, Dylan Roof. I yeah. think the congression South forgave Carolina. him. Yeah. And then a lot of other people were like, well, we don't. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there's no wrong. I there's, think there's no, no wrong yeah, response. There's, there's, no, there's absolutely no right or wrong. And everyone has their own history. And I will tell you, every survivor I met um, is in a different place. Yeah. Um, I just think that there has to be, there's a spectrum. Yeah. And there sure. are, there, there has to be room for survivors, for community organizations who want to do this work and are doing it successfully. Yeah. Just like the gentleman you described who has all of these Ku Klux Klan outfits hanging yeah. in his you know, closet. I could never do that work, but it's extraordinary that there is somebody who is capable of doing it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I really have appreciated this conversation. I, I learned a lot, and I, I want to give you a chance to say anything that you might have missed and to give viewers and listeners um, an opportunity to engage with any groups or take any action that you think would be helpful given this this kind of a, a aggressively, increasingly hateful climate that is being stoked by our current commander in chief. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's really important again to call a spade a spade. And so whether it's Stephen Miller, whether it's Stephen Bannon, whether it's Donald Trump, to call these people what they are, which are white supremacist, racist, misogynist. Yeah. Um, I think it's really important again to be an ally to survivors, make sure survivors are telling their stories. Guess what? Survivors shouldn't just be telling their stories in American aid. Yeah. There should be city council hearings, state hearings across this country. They should be able to testify and give these testimonials in state legislatures across this country. That's something you can immediately do in addition to making sure that your, you know, representatives are also capturing accurate data about hate crime. Um, For folks, again, who are interested in engaging further, you can definitely check out the book. Um, Every survivor in the book is unbelievably, um, you know, again, surprisingly to me, is hopeful and optimistic about the future of this country. And so there's a lot you can do. um, And the book will will direct you in that way. And for other folks who are interested, um, one of the questions I often get is, can we see folks Photos of the survivors, and a lot of them weren't comfortable including their photos in the book. Um, but there's an Instagram account associated with the book, um, and there are lots of photos of the survivors on that account. It's called Survivors Speak Out. 
um, for those who are interested. Right. And thank you so much for having me. Thank, and and thank, thank you, you so to Bernie Sanders for being one of the very first, if not the first, uh, sort of national representative to specifically call Donald Trump a racist and a white supremacist, while other folks are equivocating, saying, I don't know what's going on in his head, or I can't, I can't pry into his mind. You know, we have a president, and I say this without any joy in my heart, who's a racist. He was somebody who really just said, he is what he is, and we know that he's a racist, and we know that he's a white supremacist. Arjun wasn't the only one that felt that way about Bernie. This is to scene. Honestly, I was never really that into politics, so for me this is very new, but Bernie has always been the only politician that's kind of been on the right side of less things. Um, but he's always been on the side of justice, and I feel like even as um, a presidential candidate, he's he cares more about the people than the presidency itself. Like, he's always just fighting for the people, and, you know, that, that means a lot to me. And this is Young John. So Trump and the Republican Party use racism and bigotry and xenophobia as a way to divide working people um, for us to come together and, uh, you know, fight against the billionaire class. And I think Bernie talks about that and how much is at stake when that happens because that impacts our families and that impacts our lives and our livelihoods. So my pitch is that Bernie is the working class champion and if we want to make our lives better and our children's lives better and our parents' lives better, Bernie is the candidate to do that. Mia also emphasized his respect for human difference and the belief that that difference is never an excuse to deny human dignity. I decided to work for Bernie because the values that I embody are all of the things that he fights for because he acknowledges this concept that a person can be like a braided person, that Americanness is, you know, a flow of a lot of intersections. A braided person. Well, if that's not the most beautiful description of intersectionality I've ever heard, I think I'll leave it there. All of you will remember, several years ago, a racist walked into a church in South Carolina and shot people down in cold blood. Today, a racist, as we understand it, walked into a synagogue in Pittsburgh. If this country stands for anything, it has got to stand for the right of people, whether they are Christian, Jewish, Muslim, to live their lives without bigotry, without fear. Let us know what you think at heartheburn at berniesanders.com or send us a tweet with the hashtag heartheburn. If you haven't already, please take a moment to rate, review, or like us on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, or wherever you're listening. Transcripts will be up soon. Till next time. This morning, I had the opportunity to meet with members of the Muslim community at the Islamic Center of Southern California. We were all shocked and disgusted by the mass killings last week of 50 Muslims in a mosque in New Zealand. As many of them are Jewish. Uh, my father's family was wiped out by Hitler. When I grew up in Brooklyn, many of the people had Nazi identification from the concentration camps on their arms. Crying. When I would read books about the Holocaust, these picture books of what happened at Auschwitz, and the other concentration camps, and tears would stream down my eyes. I never could understand why would people do such terrible and horrible things to people. Then you get a little bit older and you study history. You study our own country and what happened to the Native American people. We study about the abomination of slavery and segregation and racism that our African American brothers and sisters experienced. And after all of that suffering, one might have hoped and believed that maybe, just maybe, the world would understand that we share a common humanity. The superficial differences, you know, your religion may be different than mine, 
but we share a common humanity. And it is so very disturbing to me that in recent years we seem to be moving in the wrong direction. We seem to be moving toward tribalism. I was thinking so hard about what I could say about the tragedy of New Zealand. And I, I wish I could tell you something profound, and I, I just can't. The only thing that I perhaps can say is out of that terrible tragedy where people were slaughtered because of their religion is that now is the time as never before for us to stand up to hatred of all kind. As President of the United States, I will not have kind words to say about authoritarian leaders around the world who espouse bigotry and hatred. This nation, in fact, will be a leader in bringing our people together regardless of their religion and to create a world in which love will conquer hate.